15th of March in 85, we did two shows at a club called Striders in Columbia, South Carolina, which is where I met Fat Harry Tyler, the promoter in Florida. He was just a college kid at that point. We did a few shows prior to March 29th as the first show with Venom, which is in Quebec City. Um, the Venom tour lasts until the 19th of April at the Hollywood Palladium. It was supposed to continue after that, but they canceled all of it because they were fucking terrible. Sorry, Venom, but you were, and you were great. They were super great guys. They took good care of us, even though, you know, legendary little dust up with Tom one time, but that was more about alcohol than anybody being assholes. Yeah, you pissed um, on him, right? Were you there for that? Uh, I was in the vicinity, yeah, and yeah. It was, uh, the stories are true, basically, what happened. And you can see in, what's that video, uh, the, the Ultimate Revenge video from Studio 54? If you watch that video closely, there's a big fucking gash on the side of his forehead, on Tom's head, you can see it. He refused to get stitches. He should have had stitches. He easily, I don't, I'm not a doctor, but I would bet he, he needed five or six stitches, but he didn't. And, um... And, but, yeah, you can definitely see it a couple times in the video. Right. And just to tell that story, so he walked on to Venom's bus and was like, where's the bathroom? And then who does he piss on? Which one? No, we're all like, everyone was just sort of hanging out. I can't remember. It, it was it was slightly different than that, but it's like there was some comment, you know, I, I forget. But, yeah, it was Kronos. It was Tom and Kronos. And, and Tom to, started to pee on him. And then Kronos headbutted him. The Glasgow Kiss, I think they call it in the, in the UK, although I'm sure people from Newcastle don't call it that. Um, but yeah, it was, like I said, it was a little dust up. No big deal. It, wasn't, I mean, it couldn't have been too bad, because if it wasn't, we wouldn't have been on tour very much longer after that. <laughs> and we didn't, we didn't get tossed off the tour. So it was drunk people being drunk. No big deal. Um, but then... Do you remember the that happening, one, though? I think I was, like, in the hallway, or I didn't see it exactly... But I was, you know, like, turned my head to see the end of it kind of thing. Like, you could, something was going on. You could tell, you know, all of a sudden, it's like people hanging out. It's like, you know, imagine some party you've been to, and all of a sudden, something happens between two guys. Nobody sure. really saw what happened, but everybody instantly saw it, <laughs> you know, as it's happening. Whoa, 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 calm down. Everyone's bit between everybody else. But, so yeah. we got Tom off the bus, and he wouldn't go to the doctor. But, yeah, it was all good. Once everybody was sobered up, it was, like, pretty much the same the next day. It just didn't, nobody got peed on or fucking headbutted. <laughs> so, yeah, it was all good. There was never, never any animosity. There was never any, like, I've been on tours where it was, like, there was fucking animosity. People didn't like each other. People opening acts were getting fucking thrown off the tour. Either just they did get thrown off the tour or they're going to get thrown off the tour if they don't. So-and-so doesn't apologize to this, such and such. It's like, there was none of that shit. It was never, it was nothing. It's a bigger thing. Talking about it makes it sound like something happened. It's, it, you know what I mean? And obviously something happened, but it wasn't anything. It was nothing. No. It was, it was never any issues. We did, nobody missed any shows. Nobody got tossed off any shows. Everybody still hung out the way they hung out. It was always, it just was what it was. No big thing. No. And that's where it went. I'm not positive where that happened, but it definitely happened before Studio 54, which was on the 3rd. So it probably happened, like, I don't know. It, it wouldn't surprise me if it happened in Toronto. Nah. Where did it happen? Because we had a show on the 2nd, Slayer and Exodus did a show at Lamore East the night before the Venom Slayer Exodus show. So I'm not sure. And then on the 31st, so maybe April 1st, I, I don't know. We would have had to have been at a show, I would think, for it to have happened. So yeah. maybe it happened in Toronto, like after Toronto or something. And so when That's you're saying much. Venom sucked or weren't any good. Oh, they were terrible. What do you mean, just terrible as no, a live band? Yeah. I mean, we all wanted them to be so good, and they just weren't. It just, they, I mean, they would tell you. there's no. They were just not. Well, first off, Mantis wasn't there because... They blamed it on the official reason, if I remember right, was like an immigration thing. Everything, everybody always blamed everything on immigration. And then to this day, they still blame it on immigration. And that doesn't mean it's not immigration sometimes. But he had the chicken pox, and so he couldn't travel. So they had these other two guys. Um, oh, man, I can picture them. But the one guy I think was in Fist, maybe. 
Um, but it was like Blast somebody. I forget his, he was in some band. But it was, so it was Kronos and Abaddon and two other guys. And like they opened the set with Countess Bathory and they closed the set with Countess Bathory because they didn't have enough material. <laughs> Like, you know, Venom hadn't really played a whole lot of shows live. Like, the, the, the legendary Seven Dates of Hell they did with Metallica was only five shows, I think. It's like it turned into seven when they, two years later or a year later, played a couple shows in, in New York. Venom were a band that, like, they created this mystique of how fantastic they were and how great they were. But then they never fucking played, so nobody knew. Like, there's those two live videos from back in the day... They're live in theory, but they're not really live. They rented out a theater and played and filmed the videos. And it looks like they're live. They're on a stage. There's pyro and stuff, but they're not. They're on a theater, but there's no audience in the building. And, and most of us never even saw those things that early on. So they had never really played anywhere. Nobody had ever seen them. They had done a couple shows in New York with Metallica at some theater somewhere um, a couple years before. And Mantis was at those shows, too. And they, they fucking legendarily blew a hole in the stage with their pyro. And whether right. that was totally true or not, I don't know. Um, but that was the real Venom. So the real Venom, they may or may not have been any good live, but at least they're the real Venom. And when you're, you're, you're a fan, so when you go see a band, you want the band to be good, which helps them to be good. Like, if you walk into a building to see a band and you've never heard of the band and you weren't planning on seeing the band, you're just there and a band comes on stage, well, then it goes wherever it goes. Then your mind, your initial mindset is, okay, show me what you got. But when you buy a ticket to see a band that you've been hearing about and you've been listening to and you're fucking excited and it's fucking Venom, man, they're going to be great. They're going to be really bad to not be great. But when we saw Venom... It wasn't Venom. So right off the bat, it's wrong. It's like, where's Mantis? Mantis has that fucking crazy... Him and Kronos get that crazy headbang going together during the fucking Bloodlust video. It's like, holy fuck. And like, the one guy would go to do a guitar solo and Kronos would stand behind him and do a little limp wrist thing. Like, this fucking fact. That doesn't help. <laughs> Make us think his band is cool. <laughs> when the fucking bass player lead singer is making fun of his own guy. <laughs> you know? The very first show was in Quebec City. The Voivod guys were there. We had met the Voivod guys the year before when we did that show in Montreal. They had come to the show. And so we're super happy. You know, we're excited to see them. They're, you know, they're not there to see us. They're happy to see us, too. But everyone's there to see fucking Venom, man. No one's ever seen Venom. The Voivod guys are from this city called jean Pierre, And I don't know exactly where it is, but it's fucking nowhere. Like, you and I don't know what the middle of nowhere is. And I'm from the middle of nowhere. He's, jean Pierre is like some, I forget exactly how many hundreds of miles. I don't know how to spell it either. Let's see what happens if I do jean Pierre, Quebec. Yeah, the Voivod guys are from 500 kilometers north of Montreal. That's pretty fucking far. You know, 80 is 54, so six. So they're 300 miles north. It's like Los Angeles to San Francisco, north of Montreal. I mean, that's fucking far. And that's why those fucking guys didn't speak English back in those days. Because... Nobody speaks English up there. <laughs> they barely speak English in Montreal. They certainly don't speak English 400 miles fucking north of Montreal, middle of fucking nowhere. So Quebec City is halfway to jean Pierre. so great, good for them. They come down, we're there. And I can remember, you know, if you're looking at the stage, like at the, from the front of the house console, we come into the crowd from the stage, the, the right-hand side of the stage, which is technically stage left. We walked out under the crowd, Slayer guys, Voivod guys, our crews, we go out into the crowd, work our way into the crowd a little bit to the, you know, not like right in the front of the stage, certainly, but like, you know, we, we want to watch the show. We're not standing on the side of the stage because, like I said earlier, you can't really see anything there. You can't hear anything. We want to see fucking Venom, man. None of us have ever seen Venom. We're excited to see fucking Venom. So we work our way into the audience. And Slayer just fucking played, and it's fucking Slayer. And so you know the fans are like, oh, it's fucking Slayer. But even the fans are like, oh, wow, it's fucking Slayer. But here comes Venom. 
so boom, lights go down, whatever intro tape they had play, they go into fucking Countess Bathory, lights go up, boom, it's Countess Bathory, you know, it's that fucking pounding, they're fucking great. And then we all start to realize they're not. <laughs> it was so sad. It was like, we wanted them to be great, but they just weren't. And we watched a song or two, we all just kind of, I don't, you know, I don't think we all as a group, I think so sort of gradually people started heading backstage again. I don't, none of us watched the whole show, certainly. I mean, they're still a fucking Phantom, and they were, you know, we, we'd watch, I, I can remember going and watching part of their set every night, and they were great guys, we had a fun time with them, they were super nice, and they could have been dickheads, they, they totally were fascinated, maybe fascination is the wrong word, they were confused, curious, fascinated by the whole concept of Slayer going out in the audience to watch the show, going anywhere near the audience. Because to them, like to us, we're the Northern California scene. They're technically from L.A., but effectively, you know, they're, they're part of the whole Northern California scene. The Northern California scene, and that's why they stopped wearing makeup, was we're all the same. It's like during shows, particularly at Roofies, when it was just get total fucking mayhem and craziness and fucking the wall of death that the fucking Exodus Slay team guys would do. It was like there'd be like 10 guys across the front of the stage to stop all of the, the, the half the crowd trying to jump onto the stage. And we would literally take a running start and jump into, step into someone's hands, and they would boost you up to throw you over. It was like a contest trying to throw people over the people on the stage, trying to keep people off the stage. But we would switch. Like, if I made it over the pile onto the stage... Well, then maybe I would just stay on stage and try to stop the next guy from coming. And one of the guys who was already on stage would go back into the crowd so he could go try and jump. It was just all, we were all the same. And the extra guys were doing it. And the slayer guys were doing it. And it's like we were all just part of this one big happy family. And it happened. You couldn't tell the difference. Certainly stage gear, you know, people just went on stage in their clothes pretty much. You know, Slayer never totally went there. What did Metallica wear on stage? They wore their clothes on stage. Basically, right? The Slayer guys never totally went that far. They always sort of hung on to, you know, carry with the spikes and all that. But as far as the makeup went, the makeup went away because we were fucking picking on them. And like I said earlier, you know, Andy Anderson to me was the one. But it was it was a bunch of people. It was like, oh, man, that's fucking like stupid. But the, the ultimately... The Venom guys, they they were more of the old school mind of like them and us. They wanted it. They had the, and it fit in well with their whole stick and the whole fact that they hadn't really ever played live. They were creating this this entity, this Venom thing, but they were making it out of nothing, <laughs> you know. And so they were a punk rock band in that they didn't know how to play their instruments on a certain you know to begin with. Yeah, certainly. But, the, but their stick wasn't that they were terrible. Punk rock band's part of their stick is that we don't know what the hell we're doing. That's punk rock. Venom was coming from more of a, a production. They wanted it to be huge. A big fucking drum riser, pyro, big drum kit, all this stuff. But musically, they couldn't back it up, so they just didn't try. They were smart enough to know that don't work. We can't be both. We want to be that. That, that massive monstrosity, but we, we can't do that plain, real, so we'll make it, we'll fake it. Faking it is, you can do that in a video, and you're making a little movie, and then they perform live infrequently at best, because they had to perform occasionally, <laughs> you know, and, and so they'd fake it as best they could. And there you go. So we go out there, we realize, man, these guys are fucking terrible, but it's still Venom. The songs are still Venom, and they're not, you know, it's not the Venom we wanted, but it's a semblance of Venom. And Kronos is still fucking doing his Gene Simmons stick up there, and Abaddon's up there twirling the fucking drums, and the more I talk, the better they get, in my mind. <laughs> they were not good. Uh, and that's part of why the tour got canceled. So, because the word was getting around. Even though it's pre-internet and, and pre-mobile phone and pre-anything, the word was getting around. I mean, the moment they fucking walk off stage in, in Quebec City, the moment that fucking show's over, 
the the various kids who were recording it on their little fucking Sony Walkman R2s or whatever they had, they're they're getting back home and they're fucking whipping out copies on their cassette duplicator as fast as they can. And within a day or two, they're mailing them off to their buddies. So it would take a week, but they played in, on the 29th of March. They played in Quebec City. I, I bet you money that K.J. Dalton had a copy of that show by the... Actually, K.J. might have been on tour this I don't remember. But uh, Brian Liu had a copy of that show by the four or five days later, whatever the mail is. You know, I don't know what Sundays and Mondays are on those calendar days. I'm too lazy to figure it out. But it's like Brian had a copy. And now he's putting it, he's writing it up in, in Whiplash's fanzine or uh, what's his face? I forget the guy in Buffalo had a fanzine. He was a big tape trader too. I said, oh man, I feel bad. I don't remember he said some of these guys' names. But um, there was a whole little fucking circuit. It's like, it's the same way the Metallica got their tape out. Like the very first demo, Lars Ulrich was a tape trader and he, he sent it to five people who he traded tapes with. And the one guy, Patrick, sent it to KJ. And, you know, so Lars sends a tape out Three days later, Patrick has it. He gets it. Two days later, three days later, KJ has it. KJ phones Lars Ulrich and says, I want to start a fan club for your band. It's like, boom, in a week. Lars Ulrich puts some tapes in the mail, and a week later, some fucking kid from Oregon he's never heard of is asking if he can start a fan club for his band. And KJ and, and Lars goes, uh, sure, why not? And I don't know if they're there anymore, but for the first, who knows how many years of Metallica's career, KJ's parents home address on the back of the first two fucking records. What's Ride the Lightning? Is that what that record's called? Kill yeah, Ride the Lightning. And kill them all, all and Ride the Lightning. KJ's, yeah. KJ's Paris address in Roseburg, Oregon is on that fucking. If you read me the address and you read it to me wrong, I don't know it off the top of my head, but if you were to pull the record up and read me the address but read it to me wrong on purpose, I would correct you. I would be able to correct you. <laughs> that's, that's, it's just one of those addresses that, that sticks with you after all these years. Metallica Roseburg. And Google's going to tell it to me in just a second. 345 West Riverside Drive, 97470. Metal Militia. But in the same way that KJ found out about Metallica and fell in love with them and started the original fan club, a week after that first show, the, the, the main metalheads, the main tape collectors everywhere had a copy of it. And they were giving it to all their friends. And they were listening to it, sitting in line for that for that show that night at whatever the local club was, and and they were all going, eh, it's not, I mean, it's cool, it's venom, <laughs> you know, but nobody was going, holy fuck, amazing. And then ultimately, the whole end of the tour got canceled. I don't remember what reason they gave for it, but it was because they were terrible. We played, we we did the venom, we did the Palladium, like I said, on the nineteenth of, of April. That was it. There were no more shows up to that. Slayer played with Dark Angel at the Pomona Valley Auditorium in Pomona on the 23rd, and that was supposed to have been a Venom show, if I remember right, but Slayer played it on their own with Dark Angel. Uh, and somewhere in the middle of all that, I took Kronos and Abaddon and Eric Cook, their manager, to Disneyland when we were in line for Space Mountain. <laughs> There's a, have you ever been to Disneyland? Of course, yeah. Okay, so when you're in line for Space Mountain, you know, it's in the dark, right? The whole fucking line and the ride and everything's in the dark. It comes up to this one place, and I don't remember exactly what the sign says, but basically it says, this is your last chance. If you don't want to get on the ride, here's the exit. And they were going to leave. And I said, oh, the mighty Venom ride, running from a ride at Disneyland. So they didn't leave. And we got on the ride. And it was, if I remember right, it was the, the Mantis and Kronos were in the seat together. And me and Eric were definitely in the seat together. And I don't remember who was in front or back. I think I was, I think me and Eric were in front of them. And they called me Chevelle. All of those guys did which is some sort of weird English slang, northern English slang. Like, they, they had this, there's a name for it, but it's, it's uh, like Cockney rhyming slang or something like that. So, Doug is dig, and when you dig, you dig a hole, and to dig a hole, you need a shovel, so they called me Chevelle. 
instantly. Like when they met me, like, hi, I'm Doug. Doug, Pete, Doug, Paul, Smith, Ash, Chevelle. And they called me Chevelle. Nobody ever called me Doug. And like in their organization, they're the band guys didn't call me Doug. Eric, the manager, was on tour. He didn't call me Doug. Their production manager, I forget his name, he didn't call me Doug. Their tour manager, nobody called me fucking Doug. They all called me Chevelle. The ride ends, and Eric's this pasty fucking English guy, like, you know, pasty English people, right? He's clutching on to the, the you know, the, those handles, those seat things, the bars that kind of come down on your waist when you sit in the ride. Sure. The thing opens up, right, to get so you can get out. And he's clutching onto it like he's just fucking, like he's trying to squeeze it in half, right? And his, his hands are white, you know, just from, from the, the pressure of squeezing it. And he's shaking his head from side to side. And he's dok, dok, dok with that accent. <laughs> the only time you ever call me Doug. 